What a powerful visual. Thank you. Well, a couple of weeks ago, I said I was going to drag you through the Sermon on the Mount all summer. And we did the Beatitudes. And today we're picking up the sermon at chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, the salt and light. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we talked about the Beatitudes last week. The qualities required for us to obtain access to the kingdom of God. And as I was thinking about it, you know, Jesus embodies all of those beatitudes. Okay, who is meek? Jesus. Who mourns over sin? Jesus. Who shows mercy? Jesus. Who's pure in heart? Jesus. Who's the ultimate peacemaker? The Prince of Peace? Jesus. Who was persecuted? Jesus. Basically, what Jesus was saying when he started this sermon was, what you need is who I am. Then it's no accident that the Lord starts talking about you and me being salt and light in this world. You know, it's living as Jesus lived that we become agents of healing and, and light to the world around us. It's a lifestyle with an eternal mindset. Living for the kingdom of heaven instead of living for what we might attain in this world. And this is different from a Christianity that follows Christ to see what blessings I might be able to get from God. No, this is living for God. Not really concerned about what's in it for me. You know, C.S. Lewis says, aim for heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you get neither. And what I'm talking about this morning is having God's nature, God's heart. Experience a transformation for yourself, and it spreads out to those around us. You know, I don't know if you heard about the Amish family that traveled to the city for the first time, and they went to a mall, and while the wife was shopping at the mall, well, the father and son, they sat in front of an elevator, and they were fascinated. There were these huge silver doors that would open and close, and as they were watching this... An elderly lady walked in, and the doors closed. A few moments later, the doors open up, and a beautiful young lady comes stepping out. (laughs) Mama's father says, son, go get your mother. (laughs) I'm talking about that kind of a drastic change, where the old selfish self transforms into a new selfless person. Where we go from being all about me to being all about God and who he cares about. And that's where we enter into the conversation about salt and life. You know, salt was so important, it was used as money. The word salary comes from the Latin word salarium, which means salt money. You see, Roman soldiers were paid in salt. It was a form of currency. And when we say somebody's not worth their salt... Well, it's an ancient carryover from the idea of the high value that salt had. Or again, when somebody's honest, we say, you know, they're the salt of the earth people. Okay? Salt. It's, it was that highly prized. And, and salt was used for healing throughout history. You know, there weren't CVS and Walgreens on every corner like we have here. And the way people dealt with wounds, a soldier in battle, a farmer was gored by the the oxen, whatever it might be, we used salt. We would bathe the wound in salt, and that would be the common treatment. You see, it's an excellent sterilization agent. How many of us still gargle with salt water? Okay, that's my point. But, But salt's also necessary for the proper body metabolism. 
Okay. When we start to sweat, guess what? In that moisture, we're losing salt. And if we don't replace it, our life becomes threatened. So when Jesus calls us the salt of the world, he's commanding us to contribute to the ongoing health of society. And we all know back in the day, there was no refrigeration. So guess how they preserved their meats? They immersed them in salt. That's how they kept the decay away. Once again, Christians are given the task of arresting the moral decay of our world. And by the way, friends, it needs to be pointed out the powerful positive influence that Christianity has had on the world. We're the ones who brought value to human life. You know, prior to Christianity, infanticide and abandonment of children was a common practice. Hospitals, as we know them, began through Christian influence. The Red Cross was started by an evangelical Christian. Almost every single one of the 123 original universities and colleges in the United States had Christian origins. The same can be said of orphanages and adoption agencies and humane treatment of the insane. You might say that Christianity has been the antiseptic for human nature's inclination towards corruption. But here's the problem. Today, it's hard to tell who's a Christian and who's not. You know, if I didn't tell you I was a Christian, you wouldn't have known it, right? It's a problem. You know, one guy comes a pastor. I just found out that I've been working with a guy for years who's a Christian just like me. Isn't that something? And I go, yeah, that's something. That's something wrong. That that, that guy couldn't tell that you were a Christian or you couldn't tell that he was a Christian. Because the way we carry ourselves, you know, the, the attitudes, the language, what we don't laugh at, how we treat others when we're releasing blessings, there, there should be a glow in our countenance. Because you belong to Jesus Christ and his spirit is inside of you. And I think the problem is today people think <clears throat> a religion's a personal matter. Okay? Here's the thing. God doesn't want you to keep him to yourself. Yes, you have to make a personal decision, but it's not to remain exclusively in your personal possession. God wants you to give him away to others. And that becomes another problem because some Christians become a hindrance rather than a positive energy of faith. And there's a peculiar property about salt that even when it's lost its pungency, it's still extremely potent. I'll give you an example. Take that salt that you don't care about anymore, throw it into the flower bed, guess what happens? Flowers die. Kind of like the way judgmental Christianity has repelled so many in society. People don't want anything to do with the church of Jesus Christ anymore because they've been wagged at with that big finger saying, sinner, you're on your way to hell. We've had to now come around and rebrand God back to his original character trait, the one who loves you, the one who died for your sins, the one who has a place for you in heaven, the one who worries about you. And really, you and I as Christians, we're supposed to be witnesses to the changing power of Jesus Christ. Maybe that's where there's a problem. Because how many of us, we've kind of settled in with who we are, you know, seven out of ten sins, not so bad, right? Well, God's concerned about those other three sins because people are watching your life and, and making a decision about Jesus Christ. You know, this one preacher, he was building a, a, a wooden trellis for his, his climbing vine, and as he was pounding away, a little boy from the neighborhood came and sat down and started watching him. So the preacher's thinking, oh, he wants to see a craftsman at work. So he says to the little boy, so would you like to learn a little bit about gardening? He says, no. I'm just watching to hear what a preacher says when he hits his thumb with the hammer. <laughs> People are watching us. And, and let's take this in another direction. It's really about God moving through you. You know, this one young salesman, he, he was disappointed about losing a big sale. And as he was talking it over with the sales manager, he lamented, I guess you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And the sales manager said, no, your job isn't to make him drink. Your job is to make him thirsty. And as I read that, I thought, wow, 
Are we making anybody thirsty to know our Lord Jesus Christ? Are people watching our lives and going, wow, you got something that I want. There's something about your life that, that, that I need. Is anybody thirsty to know Jesus because of your faith? Because our faith should be creating a flavor that makes people interested in the God we belong to. And, and as we sang, you're the one that really matters. At the end of the day, friends, when Jesus is Lord and Savior, he's the one that really matters. He's the one who's front and center in your life. Supposed to be front and center in your finances. Put them in the middle of all of your relationships. Put them in the middle of your, your, your career and your, your, your daily work routine. Put him as the source of your entire every day. And you know what happens? Suddenly, the presence and power of God gets released into everything about you. It's an all-consuming relationship that we're invited into. And what's amazing is the all-consuming love that he wants to impart to you. You know, a king asked his three daughters how much they loved him, and two replied, I, I love you more than all the silver and gold on the in the world. And the little one said, I love you more than salt. King's like, salt? What kind of an answer is that? You know, kind of chastised her for, you know, such a dumb answer. Well, king's cook overheard the conversation. And so he decides to withhold the salt from the day's meal, okay? Well, they have this meal, and it's absolutely tasteless and horrid. So the king says to the cook, what happened to the meal? And the cook confesses, well, I overheard your conversation. And I just wanted to show you what your daughter was trying to tell you, that I love you so much, Daddy, that nothing tastes good without you. And I'd like to suggest that once you move into that relationship with God, you never really get satisfied when you move out. I mean, how many of you know what I'm talking about? You're in the zone, you're staying close to the Lord, you're seeing all the miraculous, and then I don't know why it happens, but we all step out of that close connection and life stinks. What happened? You stepped out from under his covering. And I want to talk a little bit about the tragedy at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando. You know, it's the, it's the anniversary, and, you know, some of our parishioners were impacted. They knew people who died and, you know, were, were, were hurt in that, that largest mass shooting in American history. And, and I was fascinated because the LGBT community was targeted, and, and, and to watch how that community from throughout the world rose up to support, you know, their, their friends in, in Orlando, you know. San Diego and Australia and the Netherlands and all the countries around the world were saying, we're with you. I was moved by the love and support. It caused me to think about the way Christians operate. You know, right now, over a million Christians have been slaughtered in the Middle East. And uh, we kind of just passively, silently watched it happen. You know, we didn't make a fuss. We didn't try to change legislation. We didn't band together and force a world movement to say, hey, those are our brothers and sisters. We don't want this happening anymore. And I think we could have done something about it because Robert Bella, a sociologist from Berkeley, commented, the quality of a culture can be changed when 2% of its people have a new vision. 2% of a population can make a difference. And what if all of us Christians decided, you know what, we're tired of our culture trampling all over Jesus Christ? Uh, what if we decided to release the love of God into the political arena, into the social programs going on, and into the entertainment industries and the educational sectors? What if suddenly we stepped forward and said, hey, you know what, you've overlooked something important, the God who made you. I don't know. I think we could make a big difference instead of passively sitting by, only caring about, I've got mine. 
And I want to tell you something. What I'm telling you is important because the world is steadily taking intentional steps away from Jesus Christ right now. Okay? The empowerment that Jesus brought to humanity, it's being dismissed. It's being replaced with that utopian enlightenment ideal that, that you know, humans together, we can attain the, the, the worldwide peace and justice and, and freedoms and global order. Well, we don't need that God from the past. In fact, you know, the popular atheists today like to point out to the horrors religion is has released upon the world, and I think, well, let's just look at the last century when the atheist regimes killed 130 million people. Here's the deal. You can't replace God. Just turn on the news and see how it's going. I came across a statement from a philosopher, Etienne Gilson. There still remains only God to protect man against man. Otherwise, we will ceaselessly enslave ourselves. This brings us to the light of the world, Jesus. You know, it says in John chapter 1 that the darkness could not extinguish his light. And you and I, friends, we're mirrors that reflect the light of Jesus Christ. When people say, come to the light, what it means is, uh, come to the truth, And the truth is life with God, his input, his influence in your life is the way we're supposed to live. The problem is people love the darkness. We'd rather run our lives. We want to be the the one in charge, not God. And what happens? Well, you can see things just don't work out. You might say that you and I are flashlights ridding the spiritual darkness that comes from living without God's input into our lives. We're the ones shining light on the way to God and shining light on the presence of God. And and by the way, we're not trying to convince somebody into a particular doctrinal stance. All we need to do is introduce them to the person of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus gets into your presence, wow, you get to see God clearly. You know, Robert Louis Stevenson, he was a kid. And his nurse found him at the, the window pane. His nose pressed against it. It was a frosty window pane in the middle of December. And, and she said, child, come away from that window. You're going to catch a death of cold. But he was mesmerized because he was watching in the darkness the lamplighter going from lamp to lamp, lighting the streets. And he says, look, there's somebody out there poking holes in the darkness. And I said, wow, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Poking holes in the darkness. There's so many areas where darkness is just creeping in and taking over society. And that's when you and I bring the promises of Jesus Christ and and his power and his love and his grace. And, And we show the world the contrast between the sinful world and the amazing good God that we follow. Well, Kind of gets personal at this point. You poking holes in the darkness? You know, Eleanor Roosevelt, it was said of her, she would rather light candles than curse the darkness. And I felt a little convicted about that because I'm one of those guys that goes, wow, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. You know, well, what are you going to do about it? You're going to just watch it go to hell in a handbasket or are you going to Bring the power of God and use your network and, 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 and come to the prayer meeting and, and, and watch God start to be released in us and through us and, and upon the world. That's what we're supposed to do. You know, this one woman posted a question on Facebook. What are you most afraid of? And she mentioned, some people mentioned health, other people money concerns, some, you know, their safety, other people job security, some said their kids, one person said Republicans, Okay. <laughs> Here's the problem with that survey. It was given to a large group of Christians. And none of them talked about their desire to see their faith passed on to somebody else. There was no concern mentioned that their life would mean something for God. You see, they were worried about the same old things that the non-Christians were worried about. There's no difference 
And friends, there needs to be a difference. Hear me. Jesus is concerned about what our chief concern is. He's asked us to be concerned with what the Father's concerned about. The Father says, you be concerned about what matters to me, and I'll take care of all your concerns. That's his promise. That's our calling. And I want you, everybody, to hear me. Following God is not about conforming to a moral code of behavior written on a stone tablet. Okay? It's, it's about the heart of Jesus Christ, the heart of the Father living inside of you. It's about getting lost in a relationship with God where he pours himself into you and oozes out from you to other people. No, we're not following rules like the Pharisees. They followed every dietary and sacramental law, but they had no compassion for the struggling, no concern about the poor. They made no friendship with, with the lowly. Friends, you and I are called to a completely different lifestyle. It's about God within us pouring out from us and watching his hand transform the world. Your presence or absence makes a difference because it's the presence or absence of God that's at stake. Do you realize how important your faith is? You know, I saw an epitaph. Pause, stranger, when you pass me by. For as you are, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. Then prepare unto death and follow me. And somebody scratched on the stone. To follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> and that's what we're about. Getting people ready for that moment waiting all of us. When we pass on to the next realm making sure that they are passing on into that relationship with God that, that Jesus died to secure for everybody. You know, in 1910, the American short story writer O. Henry spoke his last words, turn up the lights, I don't want to go home in the dark. Okay? And I like that. Because, you know, as Christ lights in this world, our mission is to make sure that nobody goes home to the dark. And by the way, you know, you don't have to be a jalapeno for Jesus Christ, okay? God just wants to make sure that you are bringing him to the world you live in, to the people in your sphere of influence. You might be a timid soul. Are you praying aggressively? Are you working in those personal conversations with the people close to you? Okay? Are you doing anything to make the kingdom of God become relevant to somebody else? Because if not, it's possible maybe you haven't been saved yet or maybe you need to make a decision. Time to stop living for me and start living for him. And here's the power point of our passage. Jesus says, people will see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. See, we do good deeds, not to show everybody we're a Christian, but to show everybody what the presence of God can do when we let him into our lives. You know, I found a, a letter from a, a Christian in the second century. It's from an unknown author to a person named Diogenes, and it describes early Christians. Christians are indistinguishable from other men by nationality, language, or custom. They don't inhabit separate cities of their own or speak a strange dialect or follow some outlandish ways of life. With regard to dr dress and food and manner of life in general, they follow the custom of whatever city they live in, whether it be Greek or foreign. Yet, there's something extraordinary about their lives. They live in their own countries as though they were only passing through. Any country can be their homeland, but for them, their homeland, wherever it be, is a foreign country. And like others, they marry and have children, but they do not kill them. They share their meals, but not their wives. They live in the flesh, but they're not governed by the desires of the flesh. They pass their days upon the earth, but they're citizens of heaven, obedient to the law, yet live on a level that transcends the law. Christians are found in all cities of the world, but, not, but cannot be identified 
with the world. This was the summation of Christians back in the second century. I wonder what somebody would write about Christians today. Are we distinguishable? You know, the fact that early Christians were not intimidated by persecution means that they found something worth living for and, if necessary, dying for. You know, Justin Martyr, they can kill the body, but they can't really hurt us. See, when you live with a, a, a heavenly perspective, it doesn't matter what happens to me here. It frees you up to live with and for God. And guess what? That's when the power gets released. And, and friends, you're the gatekeeper of God for this world. We're assigned to be a positive influence for him. We're not of the world, but we're in the world and we have a purpose to shine the light of Jesus Christ so other people can find their way to him. And, and you know what? If you're not extending grace, if you're not somebody who stands up for Christian values, if you're not dispensing the presence of God, you're kind of like a, the salt in a shaker that's not being used at the table. You're, you're not impacting anybody else's meal. So, I'm going to challenge you this morning. Time for us to start intentionally doing works of compassion, sharing words of grace, letting God reach through us to this world around us. And here's the most powerful thing that I can tell you. The moment you speak or reach or step out for God, the Spirit of God gets activated. And it's no longer you trying to make a statement. It's God making the statement through you. When you give him access to your life, guess what? You are divinely charged. Well, let me close things up here. We've all heard the story of Laszlo Tokes, the pastor of that growing church in Romania, and the com communist government decided to shut down the fiery preacher, and they put some police officers with machine guns pointed at everybody trying to enter the church. And then they sent some thugs to beat him up, but he was in the church. And then one evening they decided, let's go get him. Well, they got to the church, and what they found was a whole bunch of Christians were surrounding the church. Baptists, Pentecostals, Orthodox, Catholics from all over the city joined together to protest. And they stood there all day into the night. And then at night, this one guy named Daniel, he pulls out a candle and he lights it. And he hands it to somebody else. Pulls out another candle, lights it, hands it away. Next thing you know, there's hundreds of candles in the darkness. And this goes on for a couple of days until finally the police broke through the crowd and they dragged the pastor away. And that just made everybody mad. So they went into the city square and they began a full-scale demonstration against the government. And once again, Daniel pulled out a candle, lit it, handed it out. Pulled out another candle, lit it, handed it out. Next thing you know, candles everywhere. The light of Christ glowing as this attack was going on. Well... The soldiers started firing at the crowd, and Daniel felt that pain as his leg was blown off. Well, this made the entire country mad, and all of Romania came out in protest against the government and got rid of their nasty dictator. And for the first time in 50 years, people were able to celebrate Christmas and freedom. Well, Daniel's pastor came to the hospital to see him. He wanted to offer some sympathy about your leg. But Daniel wasn't looking for sympathy. He said, oh, pastor, I don't mind the loss of a leg. After all, it was I who lit the first candle. And friends, I can't help but think it's time for you and I to start lighting some spiritual candles. It's time for you and I to decide, you know what, enough darkness. It's time to bring the light of Jesus Christ, whether it's to your family, whether it's to your workforce, or maybe as a church rising up and making a statement in the secular world. Friends, let the light of Jesus Christ start shining. And so right now, I just want to invite you to go to prayer and reflect on where you might, who you might reach out to in the name of Jesus Christ. The fact that there are opportunities for all of us. 
May the Holy Spirit this week put somebody on your heart, a situation where you might have the courage to step forward and light up the darkness with the presence and love of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. If you need prayer, I got prayer warriors here. Everybody else, you want to, if you want to come forward and make a commitment, everybody else, go have a God week. Amen. Amen. And as you exit and as you come for prayer, let us sing together, set me ablaze.